uh, is there anything that you would like to talk about and share with our audience about your your experience as a uh, a person of color uh, in the educational system? Yes, sir. One of the things when we talked earlier, I said that I felt my education was inferior because I had no role models for me. I had athletes, which was fine, but I didn't have intellectual people. So one of the things, once I acquired my PhD, I said about working with the historical black colleges and I made a recruitment trip into the South and I visited probably 50 historically black schools. And I set up a program in which we would take staff members at those colleges who didn't have terminal degrees and bring them to K-State. And I recruited more than 270 black individuals who had no terminal degrees. And I got those degrees awarded here at K-State. Can I interrupt you for a second? Can I interrupt you for a second? Because sure. you said terminal degrees. I'm not familiar with that. My audience That's a PhD. Not be. PhD. Oh, oh, all right. All right. And they went back to those black colleges with key positions as deans, vice presidents, presidents. And we had 270 of them came through K State and received their terminal degrees. You and know. Go you ahead. know, we have that worldwide uh, network, and K-State deals with uh, a lot of African students. Yes. Yes. Uh, and we we had a couple of them on our on our show. It seems like they, they do a lot of international stuff, especially in uh, the on the continent. Well, they do a lot of international stuff because it's an agricultural school. And a whole lot of people grow crops and you got to feed your population. I've been to Africa five times. Talk about that. Best I've ever been treated in my life was when I was in Africa. As, Where? A, human, as a human being. Where? Nigeria, uh, Liberia, Senegal. Well, that's that's an Eastern, uh, I mean, that's in the far West. Uh, no, Senegal's in Africa. Uh, let me think of the countries. I've been to a lot of like, That's all right. T t tell me why you felt so comfortable. I want to see whether uh, that matches up with my feelings when I was there and other individuals. I got the opportunity to work with the colleges in those countries and set up programs for their students who were going to school there. That's what I did. You know, I was very good at it because they wanted their populations to be educated so they could compete on the global stage. And and why I said I was best treated, I didn't know I was black because <laughs> I was in a country run by black people. That's a wonderful experience, man. It is for a kid from Winfield, Kansas. You know, my next move right now I called one of our educators out of uh, Wichita uh, earlier today. I want to talk about mental health. Uh, when you go to Africa or you go to a Caribbean country, per se, it's a different vibe. Everybody looks like you. The police looks like you. The army looks like you. The politicians look like you. The population looks like you. That's true. And, and see, people in this country don't realize that America or let's say Europeans represent one seventh of the population. Seven eighths of the population are people of color on the whole planet. So when you get a chance to interface with people who have melanin in their skin, it's a good feeling. It's a very good feeling. What? How frustrated were you uh, living uh, in Wichita or Topeka and in, in, in those rural areas 
with uh, your your ability your ability to even move forward with your education. Well, what was that like? Well, this is going to sound probably unique because my mother and my father, but mostly my mother, pushed education. My dad's sister, Beverly, was getting a PhD from KU in 1937. Woo! You know, she graduated college when she was 20 years old from Pittsburgh State University. She was a teacher. So education had always been strong in our family. Get it. You know, my mother said, you, they may not let you use it, but they can't take it away from you. She used to say that, you know. So Monroe Work wrote the speeches for Booker T. Washington. He was on his staff at Tuskegee. He's buried in Tuskegee. He was my great uncle. I mean, you know, <laughs> John Work was a captain in the Union military out of Des Moines, Iowa, you know. There's a statue in uh, Oxford, Kansas of John Work as Lee being a soldier in the Union Army guarding prisoners of the Confederate Army. I mean, I got a whole history of that stuff, man. So, so therefore, that goes in with uh, number three that we talked about knowing your history. Absolutely. As, as, be, be, because as I said, me coming up, I I just wanted to be a coach. That was the the role model basically that I had. And when I was in college, all I thought about was running track, and I wasn't thinking about my education like I should. But by going to that black university, I had different professors that said. Hey, you failed kinesiology and you're gonna be here until next 20 years. <laughs> you went to Wilberforce. Make sure you learn it. You went to and Wilberforce? You, huh? You go to Wilberforce? No, Central State, right? You well, you you already know they connected. Yeah. Uh but I had never had that type of nurturing uh coming out of the New York public school right. uh right. type deal. Then I had went to Virginia State my first year, and I have to I have to say this: I had a 1.0 grade point average. People say, "No, Nelson, you had a 1.7." I said, "No, I had a 0 0.7 grade point average." They put me in remedial courses. But see, see, the problem that this discussion for me is people tend to think this is all accidental. I say it's not. You know, no, and, I know and, it's not. The country and, and, wasn't and I say us. it's like my uh, cousin June's husband, Downey King, was head of the 25th Division in the in World War II. He was a colonel. He led it all black soldiers in Japan as a black colonel. You know, and that was my dad's first cousin, my second. So I have a family tree of people being involved in social movements. They just didn't know that's what they were doing then. But it all stems from the root. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I keep, I keep bringing this up to you. It's not an accident. They didn't probably know what they were doing, but they knew the outcome. So I tell folks all the time that white people are not stupid, you know, and if you're going to control a whole race of people, all you have to do is remove their history from them. That's all you got to do. You don't have to kill them. You don't have to put them in concentration camps. You know, all you have to do is tell them that they're nothing and show them that they're nothing and treat them like they're nothing and they will act like they're nothing. And that, that's, what we, that's what we have. How, how uh, do you feel that we can overcome some of these barriers? Well, I think one of the, uh, uh, 
one of the major problems in America today, we have no minority teachers. When I was working with the black colleges, the historically black schools, when they did school desegregation, it had a economic impact because those schools were set up to train teachers for a separate society. When they did away with them, it had a $250 million impact on their budgets because they couldn't train teachers anymore. Some schools don't train any teachers now. And they I don't, were think, that, I don't think that teaching is uh, a profession people are trying to get into at this point, a lot of people, because it's a, from my perspective and what I see, that's it's a true. thankless job. And uh, as society has changed. Uh, well, come on, Carlos. You got to understand, when I went into those black schools in the South, man, they had streets named after kindergarten teachers. They were kindergarten teachers, and the street was named after them, where the school was located. And so I'm saying this. There was prestige. They were known as Mrs. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so and Professor this and Doctor that. They were well educated and they knew how to teach our children. They knew how to teach black kids because they were black people themselves. But again, desegregation changed all of that. It was not an accident. You know, you know what led the desegregation movement? I'm listening. Oh, God. Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad went in the south side of Chicago and set up schools to work with drug addicts, children, homeless mothers, children. They made those kids go into those schools and they were wearing not suits, but some dressed up real nice. They were proud of themselves and they were Mr. This and Mr. That. And so to take away from the black power movement was an individual without knowledge about themselves is a tree without roots. And Elijah Muhammad did that in the south side of Chicago and Detroit way back when, man. Well, I, let me say this. I think uh, Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, they, uh, the establishment had to destroy them and they had to destroy that Black Panther movement because both of them were doing the same thing. They were wow. creating yeah. self-help. <laughs> they were uh, creating food pantries. But Mo Elijah Muhammad was even more specific with the economic part of right. his, his plan. I'm telling you, there wasn't, because you know, as an athlete and you running for United States track team, you'd be traveling around the country. And yes, there wasn't a city that they didn't have some fish frying in one of uh, uh, Elijah Mohammed. They they had black businesses in every city. And did you, did, excuse me. Did you see on PBS the uh, the destroying of Tulsa, the T town? Yeah, Was, yeah. You see that it was on Wednesday night. No, I've seen I've seen like four or five on on Tulsa and the, a couple of the plays on 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 Tulsa. The the point I'm bringing is that uh, we as a community, black community, respected the nation. We didn't have to agree with their religious philosophies, but we all loved how we were represented. Uh, our images and what we were doing. And from my perspective, because I grew up in uh, the 60s, that gave us a pride and you had a lot of young black men listening and, and joining the movement. Well, they also had uh, people who were in the penitentiary joining the movement. And they came out of jail with a lot of pride in themselves. That's Malcolm. Yeah, absolutely. Out of Omaha, absolutely. See, I, you know, I don't know why we're having this discussion because, because we know what the problem is. We know what the, the problem is. 
you know, how you solve the problem is the issue. Well, and that's kind of died down now. You know, I go out to Oakland, California, see the brothers selling Muhammad speaks on the corner, dressing ties and stuff. He's greeting you like you somebody. It was nice. It was nice. But that doesn't you never roll your eyes at them sisters. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because let me tell you this. Uh, I uh, have just watched the black movement unfold and then collapse. And you keep bringing up it's by no accident. And most of most of our population don't really ha haven't dove into why are we in this condition? And as I have said, it all has to do uh, major with media. Media controls minds, mind controls pocketbooks, mind controls how you think and how you act. And, and we don't really control uh, our images. Well, we had once upon a time facilities to do that. Yeah, I'm saying right now, and well, we're talking the, the things that I feel I'm talking about, they're half century old. A half century done passed since yeah, yeah. I seen all that. That's a whole lot of time, man. Yeah, yes. You done had two or three generations come when when we came up working at the auto automobile plant was the joint. Uh, yes. or the airplane plant if you were black because now that gave you an opportunity to move up into that middle class slot even though you might didn't have the education you was getting enough economics that you was going to see to it that your kids went absolutely to, uh, absolutely uh, a, a better school and uh you had the opportunity to go to a black university what i uh would like to say about what what you did as it relates to these superintendents, training superintendents and, 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 and such, that you had to go to a black university to a degree to get that P, uh, you couldn't get no PhD out to black universities. I think you had a couple because well, again, yeah. it's all structured where you only can go so far and now you got to come to daddy. Well, yes and no, because you could go to Howard University to get a no, doctor. No, I said they, they had a handful. Yeah, I, I did say that was not true. But the issue was that the employment opportunities were in historically black churches or black schools. So they trained preachers and they trained teachers. But when they did away with the opportunity for employment, that put that job opportunity was null and void. It was gone. There are several black schools now that do no teacher training, period. And they were founded to train teachers. You follow that? Yeah, well, right now with HBCUs, I think about anywhere from 15 to 20% of them are don't have uh, presidents. They have search committees. Yes, yes. And our community don't, don't know that or don't see that. Our institutions are just uh, fading into the wind woodwork, far as I'm concerned. Well, part of that problem is <laughs> they've been led to believe that well, it's interesting watching sports operate in the black community. You can go in Wichita, go to McAdams Park on a Saturday or Sunday, and there's a whole ton of parents out there trying to get their kids to carry that football. A bunch of people, a bunch of people, because they think that the vehicle for success is becoming a professional athlete. Barry Sanders, North High School graduate, Brothers Nate Sanders, he went to school with me. Barry couldn't get a scholarship. So Stillwater, Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma, 
gave Barry a scholarship. Barry won the Heisman Trophy. KU would offer him a scholarship. K-State didn't offer him a scholarship. Stillwater did, and he won the Heisman Trophy. Cleo Littleton came out of East High School. The pros wouldn't draft him because he was only six foot three, but he could jump out of the gym. So he went to work for Vickers. The Vickers Petroleum Company hired him to run a filler station on 13th and Grove in Wichita, Kansas. Cleo had the, still holds the record for the most points ever made in Wichita State history. Cleo Littleton, the cat. Hey, funny you say gas station attendant. And this is where I go with, all I can go by is my personal experience, right? And I told you I wanted to be a coach. Yeah. You're watching Andy Griffith and you're watching all of this other crap. I thought it would be nice to, to uh, be a gas station attendant. That was my high aspiration I hear you. coming out of high school. But like I keep saying, maybe I haven't made it sink into you. It's not an accident. It's deliberate. It's not an accident. They are controlling the opportunities for 12% of the population. Now, black kids who are going to public schools, representing 35 to 40% of the kids in the public schools, are not graduating. They're, they are, well, the pipeline is, they call it the prison pipeline. Right. That's what they call it. So, so how do you feel about, uh, let's talk about number four real quick. Lack of self-discipline, willpower, and giving up too easily. I think it's all tied together. Yeah, well, they are, but uh, do you I, well, think that, that that has, for them to come up with these five, they have subcategories, but they feel that these are the five basic things I agree. I agree with that. But what people are overlooking, some of us, is that if you don't have any role models to emulate, how in the hell are you going to be something else? I told you, I've graduated four times from major universities in this country. I've spoken Harvard, Stanford, Duke, you know, getting paid a good honorarium. And yet I never had a black teacher. Never. Never. I got diplomas out the wazoo, baby, and never had a black teacher. Mm. And I feel my education is inferior because I never had somebody who looked like me. I didn't have to end up in education. Shit, I could have been an engineer. I could have been a physician. I could have been anything if someone would have guided me and helped me. And you, when you say that the young African-American males and females who don't have anybody standing before them in the classroom saying, you can, one of the smartest kids I ever taught in my life was a young lady by the name of Wilma Moore. She came from a family of 11 children on welfare. Smartest little black girl I've ever taught. And I taught at the university level. This young lady was brilliant but she didn't have anybody to help her. I brought her up here to K-State to work on her doctorate degree. She called me her educational daddy. You know, I love that child. Mm -hmm. You know, she had nothing going for her. I bought her clothes. I bought her tennis shoes. She was just a wonderful, good child. Run like the wind. She could, we had track on the, on the playground. Well, would that run everybody? And then one day when she, <laughs> she started maturing, the, the, let's say the flower seeds started dropping down and she came in one day crying, I can't run fast anymore because my butt's too big. I said, Wilma, you do it in the classroom. And she bought into that. Yeah. That's on a one to 10, how important is that role model? Very important. Very important. Also on a one to 10, you still didn't give me no no number. number I said of, one to ten. Oh, I like I measurements. Nine. All right. Now nine point five. All right. Now the other thing that I I feel, you remember I said I felt teaching was a thankless profession. And 
at least a half century ago when I uh, was coming up as an athlete, coaching was the same thing. Uh, you're not getting paid anything. And when they were coaching athletes like coming out of my uh, my era and my community, you was paying to feed feed your, your athletes because they didn't have nothing at home. And you give them car fare, you buying them lunches. And yeah, well, so that's not true now, though. Oh, not now. I said a half a century ago. Uh, and then you got to remember when we were coming up, it was the amateur hour. No money <laughs> bet not no no money bet not transpire between anyone or you losing your amateur status. The establishment say all the money that's made off of your performances, we garnish that. You're an amateur. Well, up to a point. See, because I can remember when I was participating in sports. White kids got uh, stipends, nice well, stipends. Uh, I kids, remember my kids uh, didn't get any stipends. Uh, different athletes that I trained with, well, you can just look at Jim Thorpe and a lot of the ones that they try to take their medals from them doing some things during the summer. Uh, Jesse Owens, when uh, Art Rulage, uh wanted to take them on this tour after the Olympics in Germany and not pay them. And then threaten them if you don't go on the tour, uh, we blackballing you. Yeah. And, and, and things of that nature. You know, I think we talked about this off camera. Uh, black people changed the game uh, and put really all the real money in sports. In football, you talked about Barry Sanders. They hadn't seen no guys like Sanders and Gail Sayers. And, and Gail Sayers was from Wichita. Yeah, that's what I, I said. They, they, haven't, they hadn't seen the comment. They hadn't yeah. seen uh, the same thing with uh, basketball. When did they see the doctor flying through the air you had Bob Cousy shooting set shots. Yep. Uh, and all of this razzle-dazzle has put major billions of dollars into these franchises. And you look at, uh, I read a book, The $10 million or $100 million Slave. Yeah, they're paying these athletes, but they're only paying a handful of them really good money. And then you uh, want to say, why can't you, the role model that they put in front of you as a young adult, why can't you be like Mike? There's only one Mike. That There's only... Well, they, and a whole lot of our folks don't like him. <laughs> yeah, well, when I say like Mike, when we were coming up, or when I was coming up, it was OJ. OJ was the flavor. OJ was running through the airports doing commercials. Right, right. And, and I'm saying you had just limited role models that you could see were successful. And I think our whole culture at this point has been based on what they put out front. Entertainers, athletes, uh, and such. Is If you really want to get into the money, these are the things you have to participate in. That is true. Being a black person. Okay, man. All right. Uh, I think we talked about quite, quite a, quite a few uh, subjects. Well, that... you, you look at the tape, look at it, process it, screen it out, and let's do this again. Oh, we are. Because what I want to do, I want to have you on uh, our You Are History show. Okay. Did, did you ever go to our website? No. You, but I will. All right. Look at my signature line. Okay. And my signature line has about three or four websites on there. Okay. You can just hit the uh, the link. What I okay. will do, I'll uh, send you a copy of the actual interview. I'll probably put it up tomorrow because I got to dice it up tonight. You good?
Hey, Charles. Just a second. You know what happens when you get old. All right, I'm just asking, are you good? <laughs> I am now. <laughs> oh, you had to go use that restroom. Yeah. Hey, man, I did I tell you how I was recovering from uh, prostate cancer? Hey, that ain't no joke, baby. Hey, that listen, ain't, man. That ain't no I, joke. I had I had to have uh forty three days of radiation in a row. Jesus. And you, like you said, you telling me a little that's too much information. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sitting here and some fucking depends. Uh because behind uh that radiation messed me up so bad. I that was like two to three years ago. My bowels and things are just getting straight right about now. And I didn't understand, this is where all this knowledge, I didn't understand when they were treating my cancer, they weren't treating my enlarged prostate. Yes, sir. All right, so when they said my PSA had went down to zero, I'm thinking, oh, I'm good. But then I still couldn't urinate and do different. And man, then they did another little operation. They, I put, a a they put a colostomy like, bag on you? Oh, no, I didn't have to. See, I didn't know all of that stuff went down. I was talking to one of my frat brothers that's a judge. He was like, you, you crying over some Man, they had bags on me and they had this. I was like, damn, I thought I better chill out. So uh the bottom line is that uh I'm getting better now. And uh it's been a long a, a long process and I be trying to have some shows on my health and wellness about prostate issues. I tell my son that's 40, you try to tell some of the young, you need to be looking at this now because it's going to creep up on you and you need to be yes, looking sir. at prostate, but they don't see it. And yes. all of that goes with the, the education. When you don't have role models. When you got you to gotta remember, see, education is, not, is about more than just books. It's about life, man. It's about, right. how, you know, and and back in the day, the old folks they took care of us. They helped us. Call it, man. Even using the restroom, That's I right. could remember I was uh I had to be in middle school or something, and I went to use the restroom, and my uncle was in there, and he was like, "This is how you use the restroom, and you shake it off, and you do this, and you do that, and when you don't have that." That has an impact. I try to tell people, why do you think that most pro athletes that have sons, really, that really want to play the sport, that they wind up getting in the sport and being professionals? Because their damn father has gone through the, the process, and if the son is listening, he gets the process, and it's a much easier transition to get where you're going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, hey, Doc, I'm going to get this back to you. And uh, it was a plum pleasing pleasure talking to you. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to see how we can really get on uh, some serious, uh, some other conversations that might have some impact with our audience. Well, I, one of the things I'd like for people to start thinking about and hopefully talking about is the you know you describe the what the problem is start describing how the solution is what is the solution you know you go to the doctor the doctor says you got cancer you will say well how can we cure it they're gonna say well you know you got cancer hell i know that we know what's happening to african americans in america we know now how can we change that that's what I'm concerned about. All right. Well, I want you to be, because you at K-State, uh, 
go to our What's Up Worldwide and look at look at the students out of K-State that came from South Africa. I had them up at the office. All of them were uh, doing different things in education and, and what have you. And K-State even took them to D.C. Yeah. Uh, uh, for some things and we followed them and 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 so forth go look at our other network sir 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 okay sir we all right i'll be back at you program is brought to you by the kansas city business association